Once again, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I am Pastor Agnes Williams of Agnes Williams Ministries, here to continue our discourse on principles enshrined in the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for another opportunity, Lord, that I can speak to folks and to people about your goodness, about your Word, about you, God. And today as I speak and I minister, I pray that some soul would hear and they would understand and would come closer to you, Lord, and live a life that is pleasing to you, that at the end of this life, he or she would enter into eternal life with you, as your word says will happen if we turn from death unto life. Have your way this evening, O God, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, this week I was thinking about what is life? What is life? What is life? Meaning, what does this earthly life really consist of? How much value is this earthly life to us? How does God look at our earthly living? When we live here day by day, month by month, year after year, how does God see us? How do we plan to live our lives? What are the road marks? By what principles do we live our lives? How do we measure our lives? How do we measure whether our life is good or bad? Not by man's measurement, of course, not completely, but by what God says it is. So today I ask the question, what is life? I'm going to look at Luke chapter 12, First of all, verse 15. But I'll be going through Luke chapter 12 on a discourse with us today. Luke 12, verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses, so take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That was Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples. What is life? Some people live and they amass wealth and they boast that they have these amount of lands and houses. They have how many cars, how many businesses, how much money in the bank. All that is good. But there comes a day when that man or woman will die, exit this present earthly life, and leave all those things here for somebody else to inherit. So if a man thinks that having earthly goods alone consists of life. Today I t I'm telling people, think again. The scripture says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Now, we should not be envious or jealous of people who work hard and amass wealth. They improve their position. They improve the position of their family, their children, they lift up, they uplift themselves in material things. They build big houses, they rent them. We should not be upset or angry when someone does that. But the problem exists when that man or woman believes that that is all there is to his or her life. Because Christ said to his disciples, that's not all. But there is nothing wrong in amassing wealth riches, houses, land, possession, businesses, in the right manner. If you have to steal and kill and lie and rob people of their possessions 
in order to increase your wealth, then that is wrong. But if you do it on a good basis, standards are set up, there is nothing wrong with that. Then after you have amassed the wealth, how do you deal with it? Do you go for yourself and say, well, I have this and I have that and turn your nose down at other people who don't seem to have? Well, Jesus Christ in, my, in Luke here in the gospel, he told him about having wealth and how to deal with wealth. Verse 16 says, um, first of all, in verse 13, we see here, one of the men came to him and said, Master, speak to my brother that he divides the inheritance with me. And Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And then he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses, then he spake a parable unto them, he said, Wrong of a certain rich man, bring forth plentifully. And he thought with himself and he said, What shall I do? Because I have no room here to bestow my fruits. He said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, I will build greater barns, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods, Laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20 says, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So each of us, when we come into this world, we don't have a timeline when we are going to exit. So we ought to live our lives trying to please God based on principles enshrined in the word of God. God does not frown on someone who is rich, but he frowns on the spirit of covetousness, the spirit of greed, where people amass so many things. Some people I know have robbed other people of their properties, of their lands, because they didn't know how to go about it. Instead, they show them, well, look, this has happened here, and I can help you get it back. No, they went, and they used the legal aspect of the law, and they got a lot of properties that people didn't, weren't aware of how to go about to get their forefathers' properties, and they made themselves rich. God doesn't like that. That is evil. You should be able to, in to inform the people how to get their properties. It came down from their four parents. But because you know the law, and they didn't have an insight of the law, not having been educated as you, you took advantage of them. And you went to the authorities. You did what could be done. And you tell yourself, I am rich. I am big. I have much property. I have much money. I have lands, I have house, apartments to rent, houses to rent, buildings to rent. And you did not do it honestly. You rode on somebody else's back to get it. You literally robbed children, grandchildren, everything of what they could have gotten because of a lack of knowledge. And you think that you are so bright that you can get all these properties into your name just go and pay the back taxes and you get it. When you could have helped them also to get something. I want to tell you, you man or woman out there today, God frowns on that kind of behavior. You can say what you want. You'll have to give an account to God for the people you have robbed of their properties, robbed of their forbearance land because you had knowledge. You had access to knowledge that they did not have. You know, in this world, we should not trample on another one another. We must try to lift up and help our brothers and sisters. Not trample on them and kill them and, and, and rob them. But that's what we do. And when we think that our life consists in all the things we own and have, we die, we leave it. Somebody else enjoys it. We can't take one iota, one drop, nothing, nothing we take with us. I see people in, in coffins, 
dressed up in gold and silver and jewelry and diamonds and expensive suit and clothes. <laughs> your spirit has gone, your soul has gone where it's supposed to go, either with God or away from God. You can take nothing beyond the grave, but your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your belief in God, the way you live with your fellow men, the depth of your honesty, your sincerity, and most of all, did you acknowledge that you were born in sin and shaped in iniquity and made some time to go to Father and God in humility and say, Father, I know I was born in sin because Adam sinned. All men are born, are born in sin. And Father, I repent of my sin because I believe that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for my sin on the cross and that he rose again, he paid the price. So you made a way for me to come back to you, Father. So I'm coming in humility. Forgive me of my sins. Because even though you were born in sin, that is not the only sin. You have been sinning from the day you were born. Man's inclination naturally is to sin. That is why God made a way for us. So what is life? You amass your wealth. You have zillions of cars. You build houses for your children. All that is good because David and those guys did those things. But we must remember like David to remember our creator in the days of our youth. Remember God. Remember it is God who gives us wealth. Back to the incident in Luke chapter 12. So this guy built all these houses and he got all his riches stored up. And he said, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He never gave thanks to God for what God blessed him with. He never thought of helping the destitute and the poor, somebody in need. He just said, I will do all for myself. And that night God took him. He said, Thou fool, this night shall thou, thy soul be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which you have provided? <coughs> the Bible says, So he see that lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Take, therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. What shall ye eat, what neither for the body, what shall ye put on? Life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. You know, some people take that to an extreme, but yes, we ought to provide for each other. But these were his disciples he was talking about. They were chosen from out of mankind to do a special work, so they had to do that. But yet, he's trying to tell us here, yes, we must provide, but don't make that your heart's desire and forget about God. Forget about praising God. Forget about giving God glory for him, who he is. It's God who gives us the strength to live and the strength to acquire. We must put God first in our life, despite of what we have in riches. He says, consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? Which of you would take one, which of you would take thought, can add to his stature or his height one cubit? So we can't make ourselves taller than we are except by wearing tall shoes. Right? So if we cannot do anything for ourselves like that, why do we figure that when we have riches, we have reached? You have not reached until you have turned your life over to God, until you acknowledge that it is God who has given it to you. You give him thanks for it. You praise him. You acknowledge that you have been born in sin and shaped iniquity and Christ came and died for you. You accept God's method of salvation and then you turn from, you repent and turn from sin unto God. And continue enjoying your riches and help people too along the way. That is the only way you can please Almighty God. You don't amass all or gather all for yourself. I mean, I wouldn't tell you let people make a fool of you or advantage you. Because you're smart, you're wise. God gives you wisdom. But what you should do. He asks God, thank God for his blessing and his riches, and ask him, how do I deal with this riches and this blessing? 
How do I do it? Do I keep all to myself and my children? Do I help other people? Do I help my cousins, my neighbors? Who do I help? Ask God. And don't be covetous and keep all to yourself. Because when you die, you take nothing with you. And when you die, no matter how many things you leave in the will, the person who inherits it still can do what they want to a, to a great extent, do what they want. They can squander it and do what they want with it. So despite all the riches you may get and all the blessings, because blessings come from God you may get, I want to adjure you, I want to advise you, I want to entreat you, man, woman out there, when you become rich or when you get riches, think of God who has given you the ability to, to get riches. And if you have gotten those riches by treading and trampling and robbing other people, you consider that God will require that back at your hand on the day of judgment after you die. Because this man died without repenting of his sins. He died without giving God thanks for what he, is, he got. He died without being unselfish. He was very selfish. He had all soul, be happy, be at ease and relax and rest. And he gave no thought for anyone else. That is not how God wants us to live. So we see here, there's another thing he says. He says in verse 30 or verse 29, And seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, not the beer of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you have need of these things. Verse 31, he says, but rather seek ye first, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. He goes on to say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But he was speaking to his disciples, and he was making a general analogy for mankind on the whole. We ought to be concerned about others. We are not supposed to be covetous and greedy. You are not supposed to be robbing people of their inheritance, robbing people, extorting from people, because we think that we want, we want to gather everything for us, for me and my alone. No, that is being selfish. I'm not saying you would give away all the goods to people who try to, to outsmart you. There are some con artists out there who would love to outsmart you. But you, God would give you seek God's face and seek God first. If you seek God's kingdom first, God will give you the wisdom on how to handle what he has blessed you, what he's allowed you to be blessed with, if he blessed you with it. So we have to be aware, be aware, be aware and beware of being covetous. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. You can only live in one house at a time. Yes, you can rent out the others, you can have them as guests. So that could be a, that is a business. I agree. But be careful the attitude with which you acquire riches, and the attitude you maintain with which you keep these riches, and the attitude that you show to other people who you believe and you know are less fortunate than you, and the attitude of stealing from other people, rubbing up their inheritance, and saying. I know the law, there's a loophole there, I'm going to trigger that loophole and keep all to myself. The law is there, but God has a higher law, the law of love, the law of kindness, the law of not robbing your neighbor, the law of thou shalt not steal. The Ten Commandments tell us about the law, the higher law of God. When you go and you take all the lands that belong to somebody else, you are stealing it. The law of man says you can have it. But God never so intended it in the first place. If they are living relatives, they ought to be the ones to inherit. Not you because you know the law and they don't know the law. So, what is life? Life, first of all, we ought to acknowledge God in our lives. We have to turn away from our sinful nature. Turn away and turn to God. Recognize that Jesus Christ came and died for us 
because Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. Remember, as I without Christ sacrifice for us, we can't be reconciled to God. God sent his son to die. And God made a way for us to be reconciled and to be back in good relationship with him. And he gives us an opportunity while we are upon earth here and have life. The Bible says after death, there is no repentance. After death, it's a judgment. You either go with God or away from God. So you can let your riches play for you and all your big stuff. The most important thing is life, in life. Where will you spend eternity after your soul and spirit leaves this earthly, fleshly, carnal body? Because there's a part of you that never die, a part of man that never dies. The body that was made from clay rots and dies. But the spirit that God breathed into Adam and Eve, the spirit that God breathed into man, God breathed his spirit into man, gave us life. So we have a spirit and a soul. They don't die. But the flesh dies. The flesh goes into the grave. It's rot. It's rot. It rots. Or we cremate it in a fire, and there's nothing but ashes left. But you, the real you, the spirit man, lives on forever after this life in eternity, either with God in peace and joy and happiness or away from God in the other place that is prepared for the devil, Satan, Lucifer, and his angels. You may scoff at me. You may find I'm talking stupidness. But I always had to challenge a human being. Why don't you kill yourself and try to come back? And then tell me what is behind there. Has anybody ever been able to do that? Maybe a scientist tried it. But you may not be that lucky to put yourself too near death and die and come back. It's only if God allows it, you will come back. And if he allows it, it is his mercy that will allow you to come back here to repent. Or if he has somebody praying for you and interceding for you, sometimes he listens to the intercession of those people who pray for you and asks, oh, God, save them. Some people have parents who pray for them day and night. Some wives have husbands, they pray for them day and night. Some husbands have wives, they pray for them. People pray for their children. The prayers of a righteous man avails much or has much power with God. So if you have a mother or father or brother, sister, or somebody who is praying for you constantly for your salvation, you are very fortunate, you are very blessed. Stop playing the fool. Stop living covetously. Stop doubting God and turn your life over to God. Because beyond death, there's a serious consequence there. Either you have eternal life or eternal damnation. And I call eternal damnation eternal death. Where you'll be in torment forever and ever and ever with no hope of ever coming back, with no hope of ever going into the other blessed life. Folks out there, this is real. Hell and heaven are real. If death is real, hell and heaven are real. God says so he made the earth. And he did not make hell for man. He made hell for the devil and his angels who rebelled against him. But if man chooses to rebel against God, there is no other way than we can go but with the devil and his angels away from God. So our God is a loving God. Our God gives us life on earth to enjoy life. But it's not to live a covetous life. It's not to rob other people. Not to say I have all of these things and at least you can only drive one car at a time. You can only one drive, well you can't drive two vehicles at a time. But I know you might have a sports vehicle, you might have a classy one for when you go on, 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 on good things, on, on, you know, on expensive trips and so on. You're going to a wedding, you're going to a function. Then you have the sportsy one. Then you have the one to go to the market. Nothing is wrong with that. But ensure that you, did not, you do not put your heart on things alone and don't rest your heart and your soul in God. If you worship those things and you covet them and you clutch onto them and you refuse to allow God, the goodness of God to come into your life, that you can be kind to people, you can be helpful, you can be forgiving, you can be loving, after having repented of your sins. 
after having acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the Savior, after having come to the truth that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, you have to acknowledge those things and accept them and repent of your sins if you want to be with God after you demit this life, after you leave this body to rot. If you don't, you have no hope. And there is no return repentance beyond the grave. After the grave, there is no repentance. The Bible says that somewhere. There is no repentance after the grave. So today, my brethren out there, I want to exhort you and tell you, living for God is real. Life is what God gives to you. Life is what God gave to us on earth, and then he gave us eternal life. And without eternal life through Jesus Christ, what is life? Life, the Abbey says here, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. That is not real life. That is the temporary life upon earth. So today, we, we, we evaluate your situation. Start to read God's word one more time. Check the scriptures. See what God says. And let your heart be filled with love and forgiveness let your life be a life in Christ and live a life you'll be happy. You'll have a joy that passes all understanding. As they say, it's joy and speak, but you can't explain. You won't have much and you'll be happy. So today I present to you life in Jesus Christ, which is life eternal that abounds beyond the grave after the body has been rotted or burned. And you can be with God forever and ever and ever. So have a great day. Think on what I've said. And God bless you. God loves you and I love you too. I am bringing you this message. I am Pastor Agnes Williams of Agnes Williams Ministries. And we love to bring God's word to you. To show you what God expects of us. Based on his word. No.